Hello and welcome to our lecture. My name is Chris Gall and the lecture content was created by me. Today's lecture corresponds to topic 1.6, Scales of Analysis, in the College Board Course and Exam Description for AP Human Geography Version 1, Effective 2019. The enduring understandings for today's lecture are that geographers analyze relationships among and between places to reveal important spatial patterns. The learning objectives for today's lecture are one, define scales of analysis used by geographers, and two, explain what scales of analysis reveal. The essential knowledge for today's lecture are one, scales of analysis include global, regional, national, and local, and two, Patterns and processes at different scales reveal variations in, and different interpretations of, data. There's very little actual text on the accompanying slides, so don't worry if you're just planning to listen to the audio, you won't miss much. In class, I often talk for a slide and then allow my students to write notes about what they just heard to help them focus on the hearing and to practice prioritizing information. I would strongly recommend that you pause the video or audio after each slide in order to finish your notes. When taking the notes, focus on getting the major ideas and not on writing down what I say verbatim, that is to say, word for word. Instead, put it in your own language. This processing step will help you better learn and master the information and to retain it for the AP exam in May. And now, enjoy the lecture. I hope that you learn a lot. Scale of analysis is just a way of saying at what level are we analyzing the data we're looking at. The image on the left, for example, is a local scale, Washington State. The one on the right is a map of the United States. In both cases, we're looking at the same basic type of data, counties, but what, is, what changes is the scale at which we are looking at. It. In the first one, the map we are looking at is a local scale, and for our purposes here, anything below the national level is the local level. In the second one, we're looking at the national scale, and national in this case is a synonym for country. The specific data we're looking at is voting in the 2016 election. The level of data are the same in both the county level. The scale of analysis for them is not. Map scale and scale of analysis are not the same thing, and this is important enough that it bears saying again for the folks in the back, map scale and scale of analysis are not the same thing. When we look at the map on the left, we can see a basic trend with some outliers. If you lived along the Puget Sound, your county probably voted for the Democrats and Hillary Clinton overall. Interesting, but not much use out of, to people outside of Washington itself. If you want to run a national campaign, you'd want to look at the map on the right. Same data, voting trends at the county level, but now it gives you a much better idea of where the trends are. You can see some similarities, the coasts, for example, tended to vote Democrat, the blue and the interior tended to vote Republican, the red, but there are also some notable differences. For example, all those counties along the Mississippi River area that voted for Hillary Clinton, or the red ones along the Great Lakes that voted for Donald Trump. You've also got those areas in the South, in particular, where being on the coast didn't matter. In Florida and Northern Georgia, for example, people voted for the Republicans and Donald Trump. We tend to think of Texas as being overwhelmingly Republican, and it is, unless you live in major cities along the Rio Grande River. What's so different about those areas? There are other big cities in other areas of the country that are more likely to vote Republican. Why does Northern Alaska vote Democrat, even in the interior, when the Southern part of the state votes Republican, even the folks who live along the coasts? The biggest city in Alaska is also in that region that is the most red. Why is that? Why does Utah vote overwhelmingly Republican, even in Salt Lake City? These are the types of questions that geographers ask in their attempt to understand spatial patterns in the data. When you compare the two maps, you start to realize that voting trends are not as simple as live on the coast, vote Democrat, live in, quote, flyover country, end quote, vote Republican stereotype that you get from looking at the Washington state map. There's a divergence in the data that lets you know that the explanation is quite frankly not that simple. There must be some other phenomena at work. Different scales will show you different trends in the data. If we took that Washington state map and zoomed it in further to look at, for example, voting patterns in the city of Seattle, 
we would notice still other trends in the data that weren't available at the state or at the national level. We might notice that areas that are overwhelmingly dominated by a certain group, say white upper class two parent families, for example, vote very differently than those dominated by another area, African migrants. The di these differing trends in the data lend themselves to differing interpretations based on the information available. The geographic question at work then becomes how do various campaigns target those communities that are not overwhelmingly red or blue, the so-called purple areas, where people might be willing to change their minds and vote differently if given the right information and the right nudge, and ultimately to change the outcome of the election. For our purposes, we're only going to be looking at a handful of scales and using them in a wide variety of ways. Specifically, we'll be looking at trends in data at the global, regional, national, and local levels. The data itself needs to be assembled in some way that makes it comparable from place to place, which could be as simple as counting people. After all, a person is a person no matter where they live in the world. Or it could be something like economic activity, which could be measured by a statistic like gross national product converted into dollars. Or it could be something like relative poverty. Then you would need a way to measure poverty that accounts for different costs of living in various currencies used. Global levels of analysis are often a useful way to look at things like globalization. Regional levels of analysis mean that we're examining areas that are unified by a given trade or purpose, but are that, that are above the national level, something like the Middle East, which is unified by being predominantly Muslim, or Europe, which is unified by a common history and a generally shared set of values. Regional analysis can be very useful if we want to look at things like economic integration. For example, the recently renegotiated NAFTA treaty and how integrated the US, Canada, and Mexico are, for example. The national level, like I already mentioned, is the country level, and so is unified by a common political or economic system. It's often useful to look at data at the national level if we want to look at things like voting trends, or if we're looking at internal levels of economic development, things like that. And the local level is any data that's gathered below that country level, so below that national level, which includes things like internal divisions that are generally called states or provinces, cities, and so forth. <clears throat> so much like the previous slide, the data on this slide are much more nuanced if we look at lower level, lower than national level data. In part, this is because of what we are actually comparing. The data itself is very similar. In both cases, we're talking about GDP and US dollars. The data are gathered very close in time, 2014 on the left versus 2015 on the right. But on the left, we're comparing different areas within China, in this case, the internal administrative districts, versus countries on the, across the world on the right. In both cases, we're looking at measurements in the thousands of dollars, but the scales on the map are radically different in that it maxes out at $15,000 for China, but it goes up to $50,000 for the world map. On the world map, it looks like China's economic development is equally spread across the country. In the map of China, we can see that some areas of China are doing extremely well compared to their counterparts. Living in the north by Mongolia or on the coast looks very different than living in the southwest does. Rich in the black areas is vastly different when compared with rich in the light blue ones. If we're trying to decide where in China we might want to locate a factory, where is labor going to be the cheapest and access to ports the greatest, we need to weigh transportation costs versus labor costs and try to find a happy medium. A map like the one on the left helps us to do that in a way that the one on the right does not. When examining geographic data, you should always ask yourself what scale is the data at and what patterns might change if you looked at the data from a different level. Another way of thinking of this is like asking yourself how a story that you read in English class might change if the narrator changes. What difference does it make if the narrator is third person and thus outside of the story and looking in versus first person and telling it from their own point of view? How does that change the story? How does it change the data if we look at data across the world or if we look only at data for a given country? Those different levels will give you very different pictures and as a result, very different insights into what is going on. It's also important to ask yourself if the scale of the data you are looking at will reveal the answers that you seek. So now that we're wrapping up this lecture, you should check your notes to see if you've got information pertaining to the following. That scales of analysis include the global, regional, national, and local levels. 
and that patterns and processes at different scales reveal variations in and different interpretations of the data. Thanks for listening to this lecture, and I hope you learned a lot from it. If you enjoyed listening to it, please consider subscribing to my channel. I will continue to post lectures as I am able to get them prepared and filmed. When I am done with covering AP Human Geography content, including case studies, then I will begin putting together lectures about the AP exam and how to prepare for it. Mm -hmm.